Start recording. That should work. This is our first lecture after the exam. So hopefully everybody is excited about the second half of the course. I don't hear a lot of enthusiasm, but <laughs> you're busy with your lab? <laughs> okay, you asked for more review sessions, so uh, we decided to add a review session for the exam uh, on Monday. Hopefully that was useful. How many of you think, thought it was useful? Who thought it was useful? Okay. Who hasn't attended? <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll try to do more of these review sessions. Since that was, I guess that was the overwhelming feedback. That was, that was one of the most consistent feedback, I think, more review sessions. There wasn't a whole lot of consistency in the other feedback, which I'll share with you later on. Uh, not today, but uh, either uh, on Friday or next week. Uh, but some of you, for example, like the Panopto videos. Some of the, you like the MediaTek videos. Some of you thought the course was going too fast. Some of you thought it was too slow. <laughs> Good thing it was anonymous, right? <laughs> some of you like w w wanted more lectures. Some of you wanted fewer lectures. Actually, many of you wanted lectures. Uh, we're happy with the lectures, I thought, based on the feedback. OK. Anyway, we'll have more lectures. Uh, but what I intend to do, I think we're actually uh, ahead of schedule. Uh, we've covered a lot of material. Uh, what I hope to do, I'm not sure if we'll be able to do that, is have more review sessions substituted for lectures, more recitation sessions. And we'll still cover the same amount of material that I intend to cover since we're ahead of time. That's the benefit of uh, faster execution, right? You could, you'll have slack at the end that you can utilize for other purposes. OK, so today we'll start the memory hierarchy and caches. And the rest of this uh, course will be about memory, how to design faster and more efficient memories, as well as multiprocessor systems. So it should be fun. This is a big bottleneck in today's systems. and. Maybe uh, we could argue that we should be spending even more time on it. But before that, there are a bunch of you who did extra credit for Lab 3 and uh, who actually tried to optimize or uh, inadvertently optimized <laughs> uh, your designs. And I'd like to recognize some of you. This is based on the Primes test. Is that, OK, Primes test that Rachel ran uh, on your designs. I guess John is by far number one. If you can see from the number, uh, number of nanoseconds it took to execute, he's not here right now. But that's 13,000 nanoseconds. Kevin Bravo, are you here? I guess people don't come to class to do the extra credit. They're doing the extra credit right <laughs> now, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Elon? Oh, yeah, you're here. Wow. So you did optimize your design, or was this inadvertent? A little bit. A little bit. That's good. So this tells you where, where a little bit gets you. So you should do the extra code for the next lab. Tang Fei, oh yeah, here you go. Albert and Bailey, yes. <laughs> That's good, You're, you just made it. <laughs> but this is good, I mean. Uh, and the, I, I think several people attempted the extra credit, but their designs didn't work. So if you don't have a functional design, it doesn't matter how much you optimize it, right? So it's a good attempt, they'll, they'll get some credits, but they're not recognized here because the design didn't work. So I'd encourage you to do the extra credit going forward and maybe talk to John about how he optimized his design. Maybe he got the source code of the primes and <laughs> placed the output, but that's not going to. That, that, then that wouldn't take 13,000 nanoseconds, right? Then it should take zero nanoseconds or one. He, d he did what? Disguise it. I see. <laughs> he just did a random number genera generator. Yeah. <laughs> you can talk to him. But he does optimize his designs. I've talked to him uh, before. so. So that shows you the uh, range of nanoseconds you could get for this program. Now th uh, take this with a grain of salt. Maybe with a different program, your design, design might have been better, right? We have only one benchmark on which we tested your design. Uh, if we were more rigorous in testing, we could have tested with a suite of workloads, a suite of benchmarks. And then the ordering might be different. Right? Maybe your design is much better at some graphics workload. I don't know. You optimize it for that. Uh, whereas John's design is better at something else. Okay. Some reminders. 
You all know that Lab 4 is due March 21st, which is in two days, Friday. And you have two components, hopefully you've completed most of it. Who has done, uh, who, who is done with the lab? Hmm. There you go, there's one. That's good. <laughs> Who's almost done? Okay. That's good, there. There's at least <laughs> one or two people. <laughs> Who's done with at least one portion of the lab? For A or for B, doesn't matter. Okay, that's good. <laughs> now you'll be done with both of them uh, by, by Friday. <laughs> okay. Well, you can use some extra days, but <laughs> it'll get. I, I wouldn't recommend using extra days. Uh, if you if you can get done, get get done with it. Homework five will be due March 26, and this is already out. And we added some more questions to it, right, Rachada? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if we'll be. Uh, you added one more. Okay. I'm not sure if we'll be able to cover all of those questions. But if we don't cover it, then what'll happen is it'll be uh, due for the next homework. You you just figured it out. It's f it's for your benefit anyway. Okay, this is a reminder. The course will move quickly. Definitely try to keep your pace. Uh, talk with the TAs and me if you're concerned about your performance. This is true for exam performance or any kind of other performance. Uh, actually, I I was planning to go through the exam uh, distribution, but I'll do that in the next uh, in the next lecture. Did oh, you did it on Monday. Okay, and Richard told you that. At, uh, if you're toward the bottom, you should come and talk with us. No? Well, I did. <laughs> yes? What is toward the, like, toward yeah, well, that's why I wanted to show the distribution. <laughs> but l let's do that later on. But if you're concerned about your performance, definitely come and talk with us. And this is just one exam. Remember, this is just one exam. And I know that uh, you know that it's a hard exam. There will be other exams, the second midterm and the third. Well, it's not third midterm, but the final. So you'll have a lot of opportunity. And we'll definitely keep your growth over time into account. So if you do really well, the, uh, if you ace the second midterm and the final, doesn't matter how you did in the first midterm, pretty much. <laughs> okay, so you can make it up. Okay. Any questions? There was a question on regrades. So if you, if you really think we made a mistake in grading, definitely let us know. And do that by the end of this week. Anything you come up with by the uh, by next week will be too late. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. So Rachada brought the exams here. So talk to him at the end of class to get your exam if you haven't picked it up yet. Okay. So today uh, and next lecture and maybe next two lectures, we'll cover memory hierarchy and caches, at least the basics. These are some of the readings that I'll assign. You don't really have to do any of these readings, but I would strongly recommend that you do uh, these chapters. And these chapters should be available. Uh, we should put them up. There's only, uh, 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 also an early cache paper uh, that introduced caches by Maurice Wilkes. This is not the earliest paper, but this is the earliest paper that's uh, really written well. That's very crisp. And I'd recommend that also. It's only a two-page paper that introduced caches in 1965. And we'll, I'll actually show you quotes from that paper. So this is what we'll cover today. But let's think about uh, idealism a little bit. Whenever you design something as an engineer, if you'd like to optimize something, it's always good to think about the ideal. I think I've said this before. What can you do ideally? If you think about a computer, this is another way of looking at computer. I showed you before uh, uh, computation, communication, and storage. This is kind of looking at the computation part in the pipeline. You have a pipeline, basically where you execute instructions. Instruction cycle happens, processing cycle happens. And you need to feed instructions to it, and you need to feed data to it. This is kind of the storage and memory part of it. Uh, and you would like all of these to be ideal. We've covered so far in this uh, course, the pipeline part of it, right? As much as possible. We've talked about many different ways of minimizing pipeline stalls. Ideally, you would like to get no pipeline stalls. Ideally, you would like to have perfect data flow, right? You'd like to figure out the data dependencies and things will execute uh, right away when their inputs are ready. Uh, ideally, you would like to have zero cycle interconnects such that communication between functional units happens in zero cycles. We didn't talk about that as much. Uh, we'll get back to the interconnect communication, but you can imagine. Whenever you have you do bypass 
it takes some time, right? Ideally, you would like to have enough functional units. If you have 10 operations ready, you would like to have the 10 functional units to do that computation. And ideally, you would like to have zero cycle compute. Would it be nice if all of your div div divide operations took zero cycle straight? So to optimize execution, you would like to achieve things, uh, achieve these things. We'll talk about instruction and data supply, but let's talk about what ideal means uh, first uh, in terms of both. Actually, these are very similar. Uh, ideally, you would like to get the instructions right away, right, into the pipeline. Because if you don't have an instruction, if you get a stall at the fetch stage, if the instructions that you're trying to fetch are not ready yet, you get a miss in the cache, for example, then your pipeline is empty. You'd like infinite capacity, actually high enough capacity to s store all the programs, all the instructions that you need. You'd like to do that at zero cost. Actually, zero cost should be here too. And ideally, you'd like to have perfect control flow in the instruction stream. Right? This is where the pipeline and instruction stream interacts in, in when, when you change the control flow. In terms of data supply, you have similar requirements. Zero cycle latency, infinite capacity, infinite bandwidth. Actually, you could think about the bandwidth over here too, but this is usually more of a problem for data supply. Uh, remember the vector processors that we talked about? You're actually, for a single instruction, you're bringing many, many pieces of data. That's why the bandwidth problem is much, much more of an issue for uh, the data supply. You can think of this as the instruction memory and data memory also. And you would like zero cost also. And the control flow problem doesn't exist in the data supply. It's, it's, it's good to think of things this way. Now let's focus on the hierarchy aspects of memory. But if you look at uh, a modern system, it actually consists mostly of memory. Well, this is an old system. This is AMD Barcelona. Cores are reasonably large over here. But even with this system, if you look at the system, most of it is really dedicated to part of the memory hierarchy, right? So you have the L2 caches. And L1 caches, I don't delineate them here, but actually they occupy a good chunk of the core space. And I'll tell you why L1 caches are considered part of the core rather than the rest of the memory system. Because L1 cache needs to be tightly designed with the core. You'd like to get the data very, very quickly out of the L1 cache. And you have shared L3 caches, DRAM memory controllers, the DRAM interface, and the memory itself that's outside the chip. But a lot of the, what happens over here is the interconnect that's also dedicated to the memory system. So going forward, increasingly, much of the uh, chip area is going to be dedicated for the memory system. OK, what, would you, what do you want from an ideal memory? Well, I told you some of these. We, we would like zero access time in terms of latency. We'd like infinite capacity. We'd like infinite bandwidth to support multiple axes in parallel. And we'd like to get all of that at zero cost. Wouldn't be nice, right? Everything is zero. <laughs> well, I guess bandwidth is infinite and capacity is infinite. So uh, people have tried to approximate this for a long time from memory. The problem is these requirements oppose each other. If you want bigger, higher capacity, this tends to be slower because you increase the size and uh, all of the peripheral logic that you need to access memory becomes slower. The re decoding, for example. Faster is usually more expensive. This is dependent on the technology. And higher bandwidth is also more expensive. So this is a bigger is slower because it takes longer to determine the location that you're trying to access. Right? You, you probably design decoders for memories, right, or register files. If you have an eight entry register file, it takes much shorter to access than a 128 and to register file. Okay, these are all basic, right? You're, you covered this in 213. This is also 213 material. Maybe not. Maybe 240 a little bit. But faster is more expensive. Memory technology will cover SRAM and DRAM. SRAM is more expensive because it's uh, it uses a lot more transistors. Uh, it has higher area cost. And higher bandwidth is more expensive because to achieve higher bandwidth, basically more requests per cycle service. You need more banks, more ports, or higher frequency or faster technology. And any of these makes the memory more expensive. And we're going to look at how to get higher bandwidth in a later lecture, not today. Uh, but we're going to focus on how to tolerate some of these issues, how to try to get the best of both worlds, how to try to make the memory as big as possible, but also as fast as possible. And that's the idea of the memory hierarchy. Let's talk about memory technologies uh, upon which we're, we build today's computers. We've talked about DRAM actually at the first lecture, right? Remember the refresh problem? DRAM actually consists of this, right? It, it stores charge in this 
thing that looks like a capacitor. It is a capacitor. And this capacitor charge state it indicates a stored value. Whether the capacitor is charged or discharged indicates storage of one or zero. And you have only one capacitor. Well, you cannot access the capacitor without some peripherals over here. So what we also add is an access transistor. So this is a DRAM cell that you're used to you, uh, seeing, probably. And in order to sense the charge in the capacitor, you need to enable that access transistor, which basically connects the capacitor to a bit line. And you can sense the perturbation of charge in the bit line to access, uh, to, ch to uh, figure out the value that's stored in this capacitor. Does that make sense? You know the, uh, you all know the basic operation of DRAM, right? Okay, then I'll go faster. So one characteristic of DRAM is capacitor leaks through this RC path uh, that, is, that is not perfect, right? Even when the transistor is not open over here, even when the switch is not uh, connected, if you will, the capacitor leaks which means that DRAM cell loses charge over time and it needs to be refreshed. And we've talked about this at the first lecture and we've, we've talked about how to actually try to fix this problem. We're, we're gonna come back to that later on. The other technology that's most commonly used today is SRAM, Static Random Access Memory. This consists of two cross-coupled inverters uh, that basically trap the charge over here and store a single bit. This feedback path enables the stored value to kind of persist in the cell as long as you have power on. Uh, and you have four transistors for storage. Basically, each of these uh, have two transistors. But you also need to access them. And to be able to access them, usually what happens is you have two transistors that uh, enable uh, the connection of either side of this cross-coupled inverter to a bit line. And when you enable uh, these transistors by enabling the row that this uh, cell belongs to, the either side of the cross-coupled inverter connected, gets connected to a bit line and a bit line bar. And you can actually sense the difference between these two bit lines to figure out what the value is. That's one way of sensing. In DRAM here, you sense the perturbation that happens. Initially, you pre-charge the bit line to a known value. And uh, when, when, once the capacitor gets connected to the bit line, charge sharing happens. And this bit line's value, voltage, gets perturbed, either goes up or goes down just a little bit. And there's a sense amplifier that this is connected to that senses and amplifies that perturbation such that you sense the zero or one. You could do a similar thing over here too, but uh, by having two bit lines, you can actually do, do more accurate sensing and faster sensing. Okay, make sense? So okay, but based on this, you can actually build arbitrary memory blocks. This is a memory bank, if you will. It's an abstraction again. We'll try to break that abstraction later on. Uh, but basically, a memory bank is a two-dimensional storage array of these cells. And what is a cell? A cell is basically this. If it's an SRAM cell, it looks like this. If it's a DRAM cell, it looks like this. It consists of rows and columns. And basically, uh, it's, it's designed this way to, to minimize the latency as much as possible across the array. Basically, if you would like to read, for example, this uh, byte within this row, you first need to enable that row, basically uh, supply the row address into this address register and read the row. Uh, that address is decoded and this row is read. Basically, uh, the selected bits over here drive the bit lines. Then the, the, the row that's selected, uh, they all drive the bit lines. So you need to read the entire row. Uh, this row is amplified somehow, as I described, and, uh, and then you need to select a byte from this row. And this, is, uh, this happens with another set of address bits. Uh, this is the column address. And there's a column decoder that muxes out the right bytes based on the column address. And this is sent to the output. That's basically a read access sequence, if you will. And eventually, if you would like to access another row, you need to pre-charge the array, pre-charge the bit lines to a known value so that you can enable the next access. Make sense? For example, in DRAM, once you uh, enable this row, the cell gets connected to the bit line and it changes the bit line value. And uh, if, if the cell, for example, stores a one, uh, let's assume that one, uh, one corresponds to a BDD. Initially, the bit line is uh, pre-charged to BDD over two. And once the cell shares charge with the bit line, this bit line becomes BDD. Because the amplifier amplifies the charge and the, it drives the bit line. As a result, you have BDD. For the next access to happen, you cannot have BDD in the bit line, so you need to pre-charge the bit line to B 
BDD over 2, the reference voltage, if you will, to be able to do the next access for potentially a different row. So that's the idea of pre-charge for the next access. And this happens in all memories that actually change the bit line. Okay, so if, if you look at SRAM, basically this is, uh, this is an abstract look at memory. Any kind of technology can be used within this storage array, within this memory bank. If you look at SRAM, it usually looks like this. Basically you have a bit cell array, you have two of the N rows, two of the M columns, and uh, as I said, there's a differential sample amplifier at the bottom over here. And what happens is you send an address that's n plus m bits, and n bits are supplied here, and the bottom m bits are supplied here, so that you can do the decoding, in, uh, well, mostly in parallel, if you will. And these are the different steps. You first need to do the address decode, which uh, enables you to drive the row select signals for a row, and the selected bit cells drive the bit lines, entire row is read together, and they, they're differentially sensed, and the column is select, selected, and after, at the end of the access, all bit lines are pre-charged for the next read or write. So let's take a look at what the access latency is dominated by. To be able to do this access, you need to drive the row select signal over here. Well, address decode obviously is also on the critical path, but it's usually dominated by, if your array is large enough, access latency is dominated by this, how fast you can drive the row select signal and how fast you can drive the bit lines. The row select signal is also called a word line, if you will, I don't have it over here but how fast you can drive the word line and how fast you can drive the bit lines. There's also cycling time, which is basically how long it takes until you can do the next access from this access. And that's dominated by certainly this access, how long you can drive the bit lines and how long it takes to drive the word lines and also how long it takes to do the pre-charge. And pre-charge actually, if you think of uh, step two, driving the word lines is proportional to how many word lines you have, how many columns you have, right? Uh, and the access latency of step three and step five, uh, basically driving the bit lines either uh, from the row into the sense amplifiers or by pre-charging the bit lines is proportional to the number of rows you have, right? Because the bit line spans the entire length of the array. Okay, so people try very hard, the memory manufacturers or SRAM Chip manufacturers that put memories on their chips try very hard to minimize these latencies, which is not the subject of this course. They do actually try to size these arrays such that the uh, latencies are minimized. And usually a rectangular structure minimizes the latency, but we'll not go into that. Okay, DRAM is very, very similar, except with one difference over here, as you can see. If you look at this, you supply both the row address and the column address at the same time. In DRAM chips today, at least, you only supply one address at a time, either the row address and the column address. You send the row address, it gets slashed into this row address strobe register, and then in the next cycle, you can actually send the column address, it gets slashed into this column address strobe. You could design SRAMs this way too, but usually SRAMs are on chip. And you can supply the, both the row address and the column address at the same time, because on chip, this interconnect is not costly. Right? You can have many, many wires without any cost. Whereas with DRAM, where are these wires coming from? It's really the memory bus, right? It's the command bus coming out of the chip or going into the memory. So these are actually pins. In order to save pins, you multiplex the same pins to supply the row address and the column address. Otherwise, you'd, you'd need n plus m pins. Now you have uh, the maximum of n comma n uh, m pins. Does that make sense? That's the big difference between DRAM and SRAM in terms of what it looks like in terms of how you supply the address. Uh, well, I already told some of this actually. Uh, bit cell loses charge when it's read and bit cell loses charge over time. Read sequence is very similar to SRAM. Basically, uh, you need to decode the address, drive the word lines, and then that they drive the bit lines, and then you do sense amplification. Sense amplifier is different. Basically, a sense amplifier looks like a flip-flop in, in DRAM. Uh, it's connected to the bit line, and that flip-flop uh, or uh, cross-coupled inverter actually amplifies the charge in the bit line. Uh, and uh, it actually refreshes the cell as well. Once you amplify the charge, the bit line becomes VDD or zero, and that drives the cell. This is how a refresh happens. We'll talk about that in more detail later on. Once the access is done, once you actually get the data out, now you can pre-charge the bit lines such that the cell array is ready for the next access. Okay. So the key difference, one of the, one of the other key differences, other than the interface, 
is this is the reads are destructive over here. Right? And the second key difference is you get charge loss over time. This is because the capacitor leaks. So you need to refresh DRAM, and you don't need to refresh SRAM. Okay. Okay, this is kind of a summary. I'm not going to this in detail, I think, but this shows a difference in technologies. DRAM is slower access, SRAM is faster. Uh, DRAM is higher density because it's smaller. Uh, SRAM is lower density because it's, it requires six transistors. Sometimes you, this is called 1T, 1C cell, one transistor, one capacitor cell for DRAM. It's lower cost, uh, SRAM is higher cost, and density and cost are highly correlated in memory. Uh, this requires refresh, as we talked. Uh, which actually affects a lot of things, power, performance, additional circuitry. There's no need for a refresh here. And one, one other big difference between these technologies is manufacturing of DRAM requires putting capacitor and logic together. And these are not compatible processes. Uh, as a result, most DRAM chips do not have a lot of logic in them. As a result, you don't see DRAM on chip, right? Not, uh, next to the processor core. You do not, uh, you do not see that. Whereas SRAM is used for caches register files, and uh, actually most of the cast are SRAM. And uh, this technology is compatible with the logic process. As a result, it can be used as caches. Now, there are other technologies as well, uh, which we will cover in a later lecture. There's embedded DRAM, for example, that's a little bit more compatible with the logic process. But its density is still not as good as uh, DRAM itself. So it's somewhere in between. So that's used uh, as part of the uh, cache hierarchy in some processors. It's still expensive. IBM, for example, has EDRAM caches in, in its chips today. But the cost of it is higher. That's a little bit different technology. It's similar to DRAM, but it's embedded with the logic. And in a la later lecture, we'll talk about some emerging technologies that are fundamentally totally different. They're not, they do not operate based on charge, but they operate based on some other thing, like resistive state change. And uh, for example, in phase change memory, uh, that's being examined today uh, as a potential replacement for DRAM. What happens is you have this material called chalcogenide glass, and it can it exist in two states, amorphous and crystalline. One has really high resistance, one has really low resistance. And you go from one state to another state by melting the material or quenching the material. And uh, it's pretty cool, actually. It's actually an old, old technology. It's used in the CD. Uh, rewritable CD-ROMs, uh, and uh, by uh, by, uh, you can have two states, and these two states not only have different resistivities, but they also have different optical reflexivities. And CD-ROMs take advantage of their optical reflexivity difference between the two different states. And uh, you, by by reading it optically, you can determine whether the cell actually whether this element stores a zero or one. Now today, people are trying to use it. But optical reading is much slower, of course. Today, people have developed mechanisms to uh, sense the resistance of these two different states. And that can be done much faster at speeds very close to DRAM, actually. Uh, as a result, now people are trying to use the same material as memory technology for future systems. So we'll talk about that in a later lecture when we talk about emerging memory technologies. That's one example. There's also another example technology, magnetic memory, uh, which operates based on uh, the polarity of the magnets. Depending on the polarity of the magnet, the orientation of the uh, electric field, if you will, you store a one or zero. That's actually a pretty cool technology also. But this, these are emerging technologies. These are definitely not mainstream yet. But going forward, because we're seeing a lot of scaling issues with DRAM and SRAM too, uh, it's important to look into such technologies. Okay, the problem, let's get back to uh, the topic. We'll talk a lot about those technologies later on. The problem is bigger is slower, and faster is more expensive. And these are some numbers uh, over here. As a result, uh, we have developed hierarchies. Basically, mm, I'm not going to go into this. You can read this. These sample values obviously scale with time. I'm not sure if DRAM is less. Well, DRAM is still less than one, one dollar per megabyte. Right? But how much less depends on when you buy it. So other technologies have their place as well. Uh, flash memory, for example, something we will not talk about and phase change memory, which is not mature yet. These technologies are mature. They're mass manufactured today. And hard disk is actually a memory technology also, except it's so slow that you cannot use it as uh, the working memory. Uh, because you need to uh, do a mechanical reading uh, of the hard disk, which makes it much slower. OK. So why do we want to uh, have a memory hierarchy? Because of these reasons. 
bigger is slower and faster is more expensive. There's no single technology that enables you to have big and fast at the same time. So we want both fast and large, but we cannot achieve both with a single level of memory. And the idea of memory hierarchy is to have multiple levels of storage that get progressively bigger and slower as the levels get farther from the processing engine and ensure somehow that most of the data that the processor needs is kept in the faster levels, the levels that are closer to the processor and manage this hierarchy somehow such that this, this happens at least most of the time. And that's just a pictorial view of it. Basically, you have some fast and small memory and big but slow memory over here, and you can add more in between. And the goal is to keep most of the data that's being accessed here, either through locality of reference, which you've known, but I'll talk about again, or through better prefetching mechanisms. Before the processor accesses something uh, that resides here, somehow you have a mechanism that brings the data all the way into the close by memory, and that's called prefetching. Or when the pro after the processor accesses some data, in anticipation that the processor will access it again, you keep that data over here. That's the idea of caching. So we'll, uh, modern memory hierarchies do very aggressive caching and prefetching, and we'll talk about all of those uh, in the next many lectures, actually. Okay. So there's one thing, one other thing I would like to talk about here. This is a repeat of the slide. But as you go higher in the hierarchy, I'll say this is lower level. Lower levels are closer to the CPU. As you go higher in the hierarchy, latency usually increases for that particular memory. The cost decreases, size increases, and the bandwidth decreases. Here you have a lot more bandwidth to this memory because this processor needs to have a lot of bandwidth to access the cache. The hope is that you're not accessing this very often, so you don't need a lot of memory, uh, a lot of bad bandwidth. It doesn't need to sustain a, a high throughput. Okay. So I haven't drawn the picture as to which one increased and decreased over here, but you can, you can think about that. Okay. And the idea is also, this is expensive memory, right? You, you would like to uh, use as little as possible of this expensive memory, Expe uh, register files, for example, or uh, the SRAM caches. And you'd like to use as much as possible from the cheaper memory hard disk. Okay. So this, this actually works. Uh, assume that you do not have prefetching for now. Uh, this kind of hierarchy works because of the uh, locality of reference, the principle of locality. And this basically says one's recent past is a very good predictor of his or her near future. And this usually applies to a lot of things. I think we work by uh, this principle as human beings also. For example, uh, temporal locality but this is my analogy. If you just did something, it's very likely that you will do the same thing again soon. Well, especially if you're repeating something routinely, right? For example, since you're here today, there's a good chance you will be here again and again regularly. And that's true, right? In fact, you almost always sit in the same positions too. You have locality of <laughs> which address you <laughs> you're at as well. In fact, people who are not here, who were not here last time, are unlikely to be here this time also. And that's also true, except when it comes to the exam. <laughs> okay, Spatial locality uh, says that if you did something, it's very likely you will do something similar or related, at least in terms of space. This is in terms of time. This is in terms of space. And my analogy to where you sit is, every time I find you in this room, you're probably reading in the same, uh, sitting in the same place and close to the same people. That's true also, right? So that works. The computers operate in a similar way, basically. It's a, uh, memory locality exists because a typical program has a lot of, uh, a, a typical program is composed of loops. So you trade over the loops and you do very similar things. Temporal locality means that a program tends to reference the same memory location many times and all within the same small window of time. So for example, if you're using a value from the stack and you keep reusing it, you have good temporal locality. Registers work because temporal locality exists. Spatial locality, a program tends to reference a cluster of memory locations at a time, memory locations that are close by to each other in space, in memory space. And both of these lead to uh, caching. Basically, some, uh, some example of spatial locality is, uh, for example, instruction memory references. Right? You have a program, uh, you usually go to PC plus four. Right? And these references are close by together in memory. Basically, you're 
you have good spatial locality. In fact, you're streaming through memory to uh, access instructions, unless you have control flow that changes the location. Or array or data structure references. We covered this in vector processing. You actually, when you read a large array, if you're sequentially reading the array, you actually have very good spatial locality. If you access address A, you're going to access address A plus 1 also. If you have a for loop that iterates over the array. So many programs have this behavior. This doesn't mean that all programs exhibit temporal and spatial locality, but people have found out that many, many programs have this uh, locality of reference. In fact, if, if there are two greatest ideas uh, in computer design, uh, one is, I would say, locality. Locality is people exploit locality all over the place, not only in uh, hardware design, but also in software design, right? You could, you could have software caches. Uh, operating system does caching of, diff uh, of uh, recently used programs very, very often. The second idea, can you guess what the second idea is? We've actually covered it. Yes? Abstraction. Well, abstraction is good, but I, I, I was looking for uh, something, uh, if a mechanism. Yes? Well, that's a very specific one. Yes? Maybe virtual memory? Virtual memory is good, but I was thinking of more abstract mechanism, uh, well, abstract mechanism that's used at different places. Virtual memory is very specific to computer architecture. It's great, but yes? That's also good. We're not at the same abstraction level. Yes? That's good. Pipelining, I was going to say. Oh. Yes. So pipelining is another idea that works pretty much in many, many different places. You pipeline, for example, uh, you pipeline in hardware, but you also pipeline operations in software, too, right? You could do software pipelining. Okay. Maybe that wasn't a great analogy. <laughs> but yes, two ideas that work very well are pipelining and uh, locality across the uh, computing stack. Okay. So uh, basically, these two principles uh, or characteristics of programs lead to caching. And uh, how do you exploit temporal locality? Well, once you know what temporal locality is, it's easy, right? You can store recently accessed data in automatically managed fast memory. This is called cache. And the anticipation is that this data will be accessed again soon, and you'll be correct if the data exhibits temporal locality. And this is what Morris Wilkes had in mind when he proposed caching in this uh, seminal paper. I'll read this over here. The user discussed of a fast core memory of, say, 32,000 words as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words. It's slower and bigger. Uh, in such a way that, in practical cases, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. In practical cases, you will find the data in the small, uh, smaller but faster memory because temporal locality exists. Okay. So how do you exploit spatial locality? Well, uh, in this case, in temporal locality, whenever you access a data word, you keep it in the cache, right? You keep it in faster memory. Well, spatial locality says whenever you access a data word, it's likely that you're going to access the data words that are close to each other. So instead of storing just that data word, why don't you store the data words or addresses that are adjacent to the recently addressed one in the same automatically managed memory? And to be able to do that, what uh, modern processors do is they logically divide memory into equal size blocks. And whenever they reference, uh, whenever they need a word in a block, they fetch to the cache the access block in its entirety. They don't fetch just the word, but they fetch the block that the word belongs to. And this is the anticipation. Nearby data will be accessed to. And we're, we've discussed why, why this happens, right? And this is actually what IBM 36085 implemented. This is one of the machines, earliest machines that had caches. And this is a very good paper. I didn't assign it, but it talks about uh, the system 360 model 85 and its cache in particular. It had a 16 kilobyte cache with 64 byte blocks. So if you needed a word of four bytes, it brought in four, 64 byte blocks. In fact, many processors today have 64 byte cache blocks. By the way, block and line are the same thing. Uh, the terminology is different. Sometimes you'll uh, see the word cache line or cache block. They're exactly the same. OK. Well, I'm not sure if I'll go through this analogy, but I think this analogy applies to many places in life, too. For example, uh, well, I, I'll go through it very quickly. <laughs> the book that's in your hand, it's likely that you're going to reuse it soon, right? It has very good temporal locality, and you have very good spatial locality as well. Uh, the, book that are, the books that are in your desk, 
are the second level, perhaps. The books that are in your bookshelf are the third level. Boxes at home, the books that are there are the fourth level. And boxes in the storage that you've forgotten for decades are probably the fifth level. Right? And it's likely that you don't need much from the storage. Uh, and recently used books tend to stay on the desk because you're keeping on reusing them. Hopefully your computer architecture books or the handouts that we give you or books for the classes that you're taking. Until the desk gets full, of course, right? Once your desk, well, I guess you could read two books at a time. Once your hands get full, you put them into the desk. And then once the desk gets full, now you need to replace something. We'll have the same problem in, the, in a memory hierarchy. What do you replace? The book you hate the most, perhaps, right? Well, probably not. If you're going to reuse it again, you'd better keep it close by. And the spatial locality is, uh, for example, if you look at the shelf, adjacent books in the shelf are needed around the same time. Well, this only happens if you're, if you're really lucky, I guess, if your access pattern is to the bookshelf is that way, or if you organize your books or categorize your books such that this will happen. And we'll have the same problem in memory hierarchies again. You may not have inherent spatial locality, but if you reorganize your data in such a way that the data that is going to be uh, needed at, uh, at the same time are, uh, uh, is placed close by together in memory, then you can get very good spatial locality. So data reorganization is very important uh, in, uh, in a system that exploits spatial locality. Okay. So I promised that I will tell you about uh, the L1 cache itself, right? We've talked about the different levels of cache, but L1 cache is a special, uh, a special uh, place in the memory hierarchy. Uh, because this cache needs to be tightly integrated into the pipeline. This main memory doesn't need to be tightly integrated into the pipeline because the CPU, the pipeline itself, you remember the data cache stage uh, that you designed in your pipeline? That needs to get the data very quickly such that the pipeline can move. If it takes 200 cycles to get the data, well, too bad, your pipeline doesn't move. Right? So ideally, you would like to access the L1 cache in one cycle so that dependent operations do not stall. If you want to design a high-frequency pipeline, you cannot make this cache large. Uh, but you want this large cache and a pipeline design. That's why you have this cache hierarchy after tightly integrating the level one cache into the pipeline. OK. Actually, we will go get back to that again. So uh, maybe I'll cover it right now. The requirements of this L1 cache is really dictated by the requirements of the frequency. That's why you cannot make this cache large over here. Does that make sense? Because you want a, a certain frequency for your CPU, let's say. Uh, if you make the cache larger than some amount, it'll take too long to access the cache, and then you'll start having bubbles in your pipeline. Well, you could tolerate some of that latency without order execution, but still, there's a, your, your design becomes more complex as you increase the size of your, uh, uh, as you increase the latency to your L1 cache. That's why L1 caches are tightly integrated with the CPU. Certainly, register files are very tightly integrated with the CPU. Okay, a little bit on manual versus automatic management. Whenever we, call, we talk about caches, we implicitly talk about automatic management. Uh, what is manual management? Basically, a programmer manages data movement across these levels. If that's the case, these are usually not called caches. They're usually called something like scratch pad memories. Because the programmer, they're programmer visible, and the programmer says, take the data from this main memory, put it into this level X memory, for example, or scratch pad. Usually, this is too painful for programmers on substantial programs, unless you're an expert programmer. Because remember, the programmer doesn't even have enough time to code correctly. If you ask him, to ask him or her to do this, to manage the data, then they need to know the details of the pipeline. So compilers can do this more effectively as long as they can determine what's, what data has spatial locality as well as temporal locality. And that turns out to be a difficult problem for the compilers as well for substantial programs. Well, this used to be done, actually, in the 50s, and people have moved to automatic uh, cache-based management. This is still done in some embedded processors. There's on-chip scratchpad, SRAM, uh, in lieu of a cache in uh, many embedded processors. Uh, one other processor, cell play, uh, the, the cell processor, that was the processor in PlayStation, right? Uh, that actually had scratchpad memories that the programmers need to move data. And it turned out it was very difficult to program. That had other issues also. It didn't have coherence, for example. Well, that, that made it hard for the programmer to decide which data should be kept where as well. Uh, but this is very difficult for the programmers in general. If the, 
If the programmer is an expert, then this may be very good, actually. If the programmer knows which data will have good locality, they can do a better job than the hardware. If it's automatic, the hardware manages the data movement across levels, transparently to the programmer. The big upside programmer's life is easier, and people have used a simple heuristic for a long time. Keep the most recently used items in the cache. This follows the temporal locality principle, right? Uh, we'll see some other heuristics later on uh, in, in terms of what data to keep in the caches. The upside is the average programmer doesn't need to know about it. But actually, if you know how big the cache is, uh, well, for, to write a correct program, you don't need to know how big the cache is. But if you know how big the cache is, perhaps you can write a fast program. Perhaps you could try to optimize your data structure such that they fit in the cache. And people try to do that uh, as much as possible. Okay. So this is actually uh, the paper that I will de uh, definitely recommend you to read. Uh, uh, so Morris Wilkes, when uh, he proposed caching, he actually meant the automatic management by a slave memory. Remember the quote I gave you earlier? Uh, he talked about slave memories. Uh, by a slave memory, which is a cache, I mean one which automatically accumulates to itself words that come from a slower main memory and keeps them available for subsequent use without it being necessary for the penalty of main memory access to be incurred again. It's kind of beautifully written for its time, 50 years ago. OK, so a modern memory hierarchy actually looks like this. Uh, the register file is actually part of the memory hierarchy, except it's manually managed. It's managed by the programmer or the compiler. Uh, and these are the different levels of caches. And this is automatically managed in hardware. And this is the swap disk, actually, where you do demand paging. Uh, this is part of your disk. And this, could, uh, this is also automatically managed, right? Except it's not managed by the hardware, it's managed by the software. It's managed by the system software. OK. I guess let's do a little bit latency analysis. This is also basic. Have you done hierarchical latency analysis in 213? If you have multiple levels of caches, how long it, what is the average latency? OK. So you could do this. This is, this is going to be pretty intuitive. It's pr pretty simple. For a given memory hierarchy level i that has some access time of ti, basically cache, uh, cache level one, let's say, that has an access time of two cycles, the perceived access time is actually longer than this access time. Because this is the access time if the data you're looking for hits in the, is, is in the cache, if you get a cache hit. So basically, uh, except for the outermost hierarchy, which is main memory, when you're looking for a given address, there's a chance or probability that the access hits in the cache. And for a hit, the access time is ti. Let's say this probability hit rate is at hi. Uh, and there's a chance that access misses in the cache. Let's say the probability of that is this miss rate, mi. And the access time in that case is the access time to determine whether it's a cache hit or a cache miss, which is the intrinsic latency that I mentioned earlier, two cycles, and the next level's access time. Next level's ti plus 1. Does that make sense? You'll basically do the hierarchical analysis for uh, the next level, too. I guess if I can draw this over here. You have an L1 cache here uh, with an intrinsic access latency of T1 cycles. And the number of cycles it takes to access the entire hierarchy is the larger T1. And then you have an L2 cache over here, which intrinsic access latency is T2 cycles. And T2 is usually larger than T1 because it's a larger memory. And T1 cycles refers to uh, basically the access time perceived access time of the entire thing over here. Maybe I should put it over here. And then T2 cycles, large T2, refers to the access time of the entire hierarchy below L2. I guess before we go over here, uh, this is, uh, if you actually consider hit time, uh, well, this is a hit rate, this is a miss rate, they should all be equal to 1, right? Because this is the total number of axes. They either hit or miss. So basically, hi is 1 minus mi. So the time it takes to access one level looks like this. Time it takes to access this level is uh, the time it takes uh, the, the hit rate at that level times the hit latency plus 
the miss rate at that level times the perceived access time of the next level. That's the hierarchical equation. This is this one. So basically, if you want if you want t1 over here, in order to get you'll get t1 plus uh, well I guess that's t1 right? Yeah. You need to have t2. Okay. But of course you need to have the miss rate over here as well. So let me write it in a different way. This is uh, h times uh, t1 plus uh, or h1 times t1 plus m1 times uh, I would say t2. And then you can write t2 in a similar way, in a hierarchical way, right? This is h1, h2 times t2 plus m2 times t3, and then so on, as many levels as you can. This is a recursive equation, basically. And then you can simplify the equation, and this is what you get, basically. The time it takes to access any level is the hit latency to that level plus the miss rate times the perceived access latency to the next level. OK? That's pretty simple, actually. You can, we'll go through an example soon. Uh, well, I think we've talked about this, right? H1, HI, and MI are the hit rate and miss rate. And these are just the references that missed at that level. Okay, so this is the recursive latency equation that I kind of uh, put out over here. Except once you, once you substitute M, M1 equals 1 minus H1, you'll get that. And then substitute 1 with I over there. So the goal is to achieve the desired T1, if you will. T1 is the highest level over here within allowed cost. That's how you design the hierarchy somehow. It's actually more of a work of art than uh, optimization. But ideally, you would like to get ti equals to this little ti, the inherent access latency of that level. You don't want to miss in that next level, but, or you want to minimize uh, the penalty of the miss. So to be able to do that, there are two things you can do, right? Well, actually, there are three things you, you would like to do. You would certainly like to minimize ti as much as possible, but there's a downside to that. If you would like to minimize the ti, then your capacity needs to be smaller. Let's assume that you have some ti that's inherent. Uh, you would like to minimize this portion. So how do you minimize that portion? Well, you can keep the miss rates at this level low, or you can keep uh, the ti plus 1, the access latency of the remaining levels, low. So in order to keep the miss rates at this level low, you should increase the capacity. Right? That's one option. The problem is this lowers the miss rate, hopefully, assuming locality uh, have, uh, locality exists, but this increases the access time also. So you have a trade-off, right? To reduce the miss rate, you increase the hit latency. Or you could do you could lower the miss rate by smarter management techniques that we will talk about. How to do replacement, basically, anticipate what you don't need, uh, and kick it out of the cache early. Or do prefetch, anticipate what you will need and bring it into the cache early. That way you can minimize this miss rate at that level. The second is you can keep this perceived latency of the lower or higher levels low. Uh, you can have faster hierarchies over there, but then again, you can increase cost. So you need to be careful. So uh, that, this is the reason intermediate levels are introduced as a compromise, to be able to uh, keep uh, this part of the equation as low as possible. Okay, let me give you some examples. This is actually an old example from Intel uh, Pentium 4, which had a 3.6 gigahertz clock. Uh, at 90 mm, mm, nanometer node. node. Uh, the L1 cache was 16 uh, kilobytes, and the intrinsic latency of it was four cycles for integer operations. Nine cycles for FP operations, because FP operations actually required a larger uh, cache line. Uh, for L2, uh, the cache size was one megabyte, and uh, the access time was 18 cycles, inherent access time. And main memory assumed that its access time is 15 nanoseconds and assume that all data is in main memory. So best case latency in this case is not one. Right? This is one interesting. In modern uh, processors with very high frequencies, usually cache access takes more than one cycle. And it's pipelined. So you could do mu multiple cache accesses. You can still re re retain the throughput of the cache uh, of one, one, one operation, one request service per cycle. And worst case access latencies are actually much worse than this. This is. We will cover main memory later, but this was one of the best case access latencies. So let's do the hierarchical analysis of this. Let's assume that the miss rate at the L1 level is 
0.1, and miss rate at the L2 level for the references that go into the L2 is 10%. Basically, you get 90% hit rate over here and 90% hit rate over here. If you put these into the equations, the T1 access time is actually 7.6 cycles. Basically, it's much higher than four cycles, right? Now, if you have a program that has these miss rates, 99% hit rate over here and 99% hit rate over here, then you get much better access latencies, right? You get very close to 4.2. Uh, we get very close to the inherent access latency over here. The access latency is 4.2, the perceived latency. Now, let's take a look at uh, this. You, your hit rate in the L1 cache is 95%, this rate is 5%, and your hit rate in the L2 cache is 99%. Basically, out of those 5% of all the references, 99% hits in the L2 cache. This is actually good uh, because your T2 is similar to over here because it's 99% of the reference over the hit here. But T1 is uh, also low, it's fine. Now let's look at the uh, one other downside, I guess. Uh, one, uh, one, one other way of achieving something similar. Your hit rate at the L1 cache is 99%, but your miss rate at the L2 cache is 50%. Remember, this is the miss rate for all the references that actually go to the L2 cache. L1 cache is very good at filtering all of these references. So only 1% of classes of reference go into the L2 cache, but 50% of them actually miss over here. So even though your T2 is very, very high here, your T1 is still really, relatively low because your L1 cache is very efficient. So you can, you can do these calculations and uh, have fun with it. So different, th these are different ways of getting similar latencies, uh, but your caching, uh, the effort you put into the different caches are different here. And also this depends on your program, right? How do you actually get 0.01% uh, 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 miss rate in the L1 cache? Many programs uh, look like this. You get 10% miss rate in the L1 cache, and you get about 50% miss rate in the L2 cache. Because your locality gets filtered as you go down in the hierarchy level, or as you go up in the hierarchy level, and you, your caching is not as effective. Okay. But that's not all, all, always true also. If your working set, for example, fits into this 1,024 kilobytes, if it's uh, less than one megabyte, then you always fit into the L L2 cache, right? Okay. Okay, take this, take, again, take this with a grain of salt because this gives you the access latency, right? This is not really the performance. This is the perceived access latency. What is performance? That's really dependent on a lot of other things, like how much you can tolerate this latency for example. Maybe you have out-of-order execution and you tolerate much of this latency. It doesn't get exposed. Okay? Okay. Let's see how we're doing on time. Maybe before we start cache basics, let's take a five-minute break. Is that good with everyone? Okay. Let's go come back at 135. All right. Let's get started. Now we can delve into caches a little bit. A little bit more. Basically, cache exists in many places. Generically, it's any structure that memoizes frequently or recently used results, such that you avoid repeating the long latency operations required to reproduce the result from scratch. So people have used cache in web, for example. Your browser does aggressive caching for the websites that you recently knew. In fact, you sometimes want to clear that cache, such that you can get the most up-to-date results, right? Uh, so it's, it's an idea that's used in many places. But we'll talk about the on-DAI or hardware context. Uh, in the on-DAI context, it's an automatically managed memory hierarchy, usually based on SRAM, although that doesn't have to be the case. But we'll talk about uh, how, how the cache is designed in hardware. Uh, one way of using uh, caches is memorized in SRAM, the most frequently you access DRM memory locations to avoid repeatedly paying for the DRM access latency. That's what most processors today do. So, so let me give you some terminology so that everyone is on the same page. But a block or a line, the same thing, it's the unit of storage in the cache. And this could consist of multiple bytes, or many, many bytes, actually. And memory is actually logically divided into cache blocks that map to locations in the cache. And the flexibility with which those, uh, 
memory blocks mapped to locations in the cache determine how efficient your caching could be. We'll talk about that soon. A hit or miss, I've assumed that you know this, but let's define it. When a data element is referenced, if it's in the cache, uh, this, this means it's a hit. And then you can use the cache data instead of accessing memory. If it's not in the cache, then this means it's a miss. To check if it's in the cache or if it's not in the cache, you need to look up some metadata, which is also called a tag store. That uh, basically determines if, if the reference data is hit or miss. If it's not in the cache, then you bring the block into the cache in the simplest uh, way of caching. But there are many mechanisms that decide whether or not actually to place the da data into the cache, right? When you miss uh, for a data element, you actually bring the block uh, the data element uh, resides in into the cache, or do you actually use the data and discard the block? Right, that's one, that could be one option. If, the, if you determine the block doesn't have good temporal or spatial locality, you may decide not to put it into the cache. Existing processors do optimizations like that. We're not going to go into that right now. So if a uh, block misses in the cache and you bring in uh, that block, maybe you need to kick something else out to place it into the cache, right? Because if your cache is full, or if part of your cache where this block can map to is full, this is called a set, then you need to kick out something from that same set. Right? There are many important cache design decisions that people have optimized for decades and decades. In fact, at some point, uh, Maybe it's still true. The, the premier computer architecture conference, International Symposium on Computer Architecture, people used to make fun of it by saying it's the International Symposium on Cache Architecture. Because there's so much importance placed into the cache that there are so many papers that try to optimize the design of the cache. Uh, for good reason. It's really an important part of uh, the processor. OK, so placement uh, is a basic decision. Where do you place the block in the cache? And how do you find the block in the cache? Replacement, again, this is something that a cache designer needs to decide. What data to remove to make room in the cache, if this is an issue? Ground nitro management, do you have large blocks, small blocks, uniform blocks? Usually most caches have uniform blocks, but even that design decision can be questioned. And we'll talk about the advantage and disadvantage of these large and small blocks. Write policy. What do you do about writes? If you're writing to a location, do you actually bring the entire block into the cache and allocate it? Instructions versus data. Do we treat them separately in the cache? And there are many, many other design decisions. Do you, how do you actually do the replacement? Uh, do you, what, what, uh, what factors do you take into account? Uh, placement is also called insertion. Where do you insert in the cache and how do you insert in the cache? Do you even insert a block into the cache? Or do you just supply it to the processor? Okay. This is kind of an abstract view of the cache. Basically, uh, you provide an address to the cache, and you provide it either concurrently or serially to the tag store and the data store. Tag store is really used for bookkeeping. It's also called metadata. This is really the data that you're caching from memory. These are the memory blocks, if you will, that are cached on die. Tag store is the metadata that's used to identify those blocks. What block is it? That's the tag. Is this actually, is this location in the cache housing a valid block? Have I put something to it, the valid bit, that part of this tag store? When was the last time I accessed it? This could be useful for replacement, right? All of that information is kept in the tag store. Uh, bookkeeping plus is this address in the cache. So you supply the address to the tag store, you get a hit miss signal. And in parallel, you can supply the address to the data store and you can get all of the data out, and if the hit miss signal says hit, then you use the data. If the hit miss signal says miss, then you don't use that data. That's the idea. Or you could access the serially, which we'll talk about. Uh, the serial access, you could first access the tag store, determine if it's a hit or miss, and if it's a hiss, hit, only then you address the da access the data store. Obviously, this increases the access latency on a hit. Right? But it may save power, because for missing uh, accesses, you don't you don't activate, you don't access the data store unnecessarily. <laughs> so you have all these design decisions. For the first level cache, usually you do parallel access of the tag and data store because you want the data really quickly. Many processors today have serial access in the tag store and the data store in the large level three caches to save power because you do not want to power up the entire array that's on the order of one megabyte or more uh, in case you're gonna miss. Okay, so this is the cache hit rate. Uh, well, this is simple, basically. Number of hits divided by number of hits plus number of misses. 
or its number of hits divided by number of accesses. And average memory access time is very similar to what we've discussed over here. It's basically hit rate times hit latency plus miss rate times miss latency. And miss latency for the next level is hit rate times hit latency for the next level plus miss rate times miss latency for the next level. So one aside, uh, this is one way of evaluating cache performance, uh, but this may not be the best way. And this is a good rule of thumb. One question I have for you is, can reducing this AMAT, average memory access time, actually reduce performance? Ideally, you would like to reduce average memory access time as and make it as little as possible, right? But can it reduce performance? I guess this was a leading question. The answer should be yes. Maybe I'll, I'll let you think about it. But yeah, this can reduce performance. Because remember, the entire performance of a program is not about just the memory access time. It's about how much overlapping that happens, for example. You may reduce the average memory access time, but you may actually have very long latency misses. You may increase those long latency misses where the processor actually is stalled. You can reduce memory level parallelism. So we'll get back to that at some point. OK, so let's take a look at how the cache is designed in a little bit more detail. This probably you've been familiar with uh, from 2.13, right? But we'll go into how the cache is designed. Basically, memory is logically divided into cache blocks. And each block maps to a location of the cache. And that is determined by the index bits in the address. So we're going to chop the address into multiple portions. And I guess, actually, I'll use that example, a small cache in this case. Basically, we have an 8-bit address. And assume that the uh, uh, basically, an address is chopped into multiple pieces. Uh, you have, uh, eight, assume that this is a byte addressable machine, and a block consists of eight bytes. So maybe I'll, I'll do this. A cache has eight byte blocks, eight bit address, byte addressable, and uh, the cache can house, let's see, in this case, we have uh, three bits for the index. So the cache can house eight blocks. And let's assume this is a direct map cache. And I'll define this direct map later on. But if this is the case, basically, uh, these are the bits, 0 through 7. The bottom bits are used to indicate the bytes in block. You don't need these to index into the cache and to figure out uh, whether the block actually exists in the cache, because this is really the bytes in the block. Uh, then. You need some bits to index into the cache, and that these are called the index bits. And if you have eight blocks and the cache is direct mapped, you need only three bits right, to do that. And the remaining part is called the tag. In this case, you have only two bits left for the tag. These two together are used to locate the block in the cache. This is also called block address, if you will, or line address. These are what you need to locate the block in the cache. Uh, and to access the cache, remember I showed you the tag and data stores. I'll make it uh, a little bit more explicit right now. We said we have eight blocks in this toy cache, if you will. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight locations in both the tag and the data store. Let's see if I can make this correspond. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's good. I can count. So you use the index bits to actually index into both, let's assume, at the same time. So this basically goes through a decoder. I'll call this the index decoder, if you will. And it enables one location over here, same as over here. Okay. And at the, uh, this is the tag store and the data store. So the hope is that you've designed these tag store and data store such that the tag store comes out. And the tag store indicates, what does the tag store have? Basically, it has a valid bit, and it has a tag of the cache block stored in this location. Right. And what happens is you compare the tag, this is a cache access, of the block that you're searching to the tag that's stored in this location, only if the valid bit is true, of course. There's a comparator. And if the valid bit is true, and the comparator says match, which is a yes, then this means that it's a hit, right? That's your hit signal. 
I don't know if you can see it from the back, but that's the idea. Basically, you index the cache, tag store, with the index bits coming out of your cache. That supplies the tag that's stored in that location, uh, in that location that houses the block. And that also supplies whether the block is valid, if you will. If the block is valid and the tag you're searching for matches the tag that's stored, then there's a cache hit. Okay? Then you can use the block that's stored in the data store in the same location because you've already indexed to the same location. Now let's make this the same location. Now you have the block, uh, and the block contains eight bytes, right? Let's assume you want one byte. Well, how do you get the one byte out of that? Basically, you have a mux. Right? Well, this part becomes more complicated because you may want actually two bytes or three bytes, right? Basically, you use this byte in block to get the byte you want. Mux out the byte you want. Okay, I'll have this figure in the next slide. But that's the idea. There's a hardware structure that looks like this. Okay, well this, this basically says the same thing. How do you actually do a cache access? You index into the tag and data stores, tag and data stores, with the index bits in the address. And these index bits happen to come from these bits over here. Uh, and compare, uh, check the valid bit in the tag store for that location. Compare the tag bits in the address with the store tag in the tag store. This gives you a hit or miss. If the block is in the cache, cache it, the tag store should have the tag of the block stored in the index of the block. Okay? And this is, a, this is the same example that I showed you over here. Assume, well, I didn't show you the memory over here, but uh, with eight byte blocks uh, and eight uh, entry cache or 64 byte cache, this is what you get. Okay? Any questions? Is this all familiar to everyone, by the way? Yes? Who knows all of this by heart? Uh, more, or so, more or less. Okay. Okay, then I'll go faster. So in this case, <laughs> no, <laughs> I should not. <laughs> right, in this case, uh, you, you have to shout if you don't know. <laughs> Otherwise, people who know will <laughs> tell me that they know. This is actually 213 material, right? Yes. So would the conflictness be if like, you address, you index into the same spot, but your tag is different? Exactly, yes. A conflict miss is you index into the same spot, but your tag is different. So that's why I, I draw this memory picture over here. So assume that this is, again, a toy memory. Assume that you have 256 bytes in your memory. Uh, and you have eight byte blocks. Basically, logically, the memory looks like this. You divide, you have 32 blocks in it, if you will. Ignore the green one for now. You have 32 blocks in it. And each block is eight bytes. And each block can go to a single location in the cache. Because their index, they, uh, basically, you have only one block that can be stored at a given index. right? And what is stored in that index is determined by the tag bit of the block that's stored there. So if you look at this, the index bits, basically blocks that have the same index bits map to the same location in the cache. And you cannot store both of those blocks at the same time in the cache. Whenever you need to access them one after another, you'll get conflict misses. Make sense? You've heard about conflict misses probably. But basically, I've, uh, th this is where the green part comes in. This is block 0, this is block 8, this is block 16, block 32. What is common among them? Well, they share the same index bits. All of the index bits are 0, 0, 0, 0 for these blocks. And they actually map to this location in the cache that has index 0, 0, 0. So if you want to store two of these green blocks at the same time in the cache, well, tough luck, you cannot. Because your cache is not flexible. It can store only one block with the same index bits in the address. Okay? That's why this is called the direct map cache. A block in memory can be stored only in one possible location in the cache, one possible index. Well, one possible location, actually, is in the cache. Even though you can house eight blocks in the cache, you cannot map any block flexibly to any location the index bits of the address determines the location. And that's the downside of uh, the direct map cache. Addresses with the same index content for the same location, and they cause conflict misses. For example, think about the pattern where you're accessing block 0, block, and then block 8. And you keep accessing block 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8. Well, you get a 0% cache hit rate in this case, right? If you have least recently used. 
Well, it doesn't matter actually, uh, because you can only store either block zero or block eight. If you actually keep putting the block into the cache, every time you access it, you get a 0% hit rate. Because you first access zero, place it into the cache, and then you access block eight, you access the cache, you figure out eight is not here, so you place it into the cache, and then you access zero again, well, too bad, eight dislocated zero, so you get a cache miss all, all over it, all over. So to eliminate this, we make the cache more flexible. Well, I guess let me cover this. We already talked about this, right? Two blocks in memory that map to the same index in the cache cannot be present in the cache at the same time. One index stores one entry. That's the problem. This can lead to 0% hit rate if more than one block is accessed and in an interleaved manner mapped to the same index. This is what basically what I showed you over here. And you can generalize to addresses A and B that have the same index bit but different tag bits. And in fact, blocks 0 and 8 over here have index bits 0, 0, 0, but they different tag bits. This is the tag bits of this is 0, 0. The tag bits of this is 0, 1. OK. So all of the access here are conflict misses. So how do we actually eliminate this or reduce the amount of conflict misses, if you will? So conflict misses happen because a block can go to only a limited number of locations in the cache. In this case, the limited number is one, only one location. So let's relax this element. Basically, that's the idea of associativity, set associativity. Instead of having one column of eight, if you will, if you, instead of having eight indices where each index can store one block, have two columns of four. Have four indices that each of which can store two blocks. And then you can distinguish between the blocks based on by having two different tags for the same index. That's the idea of a set associative cache. In this case, it's a two-way set associative cache. Basically, tag store looks like this. You can have tags and valid bits for two blocks. And data store is organized this way. You can store two blocks given the same index. Make sense? And the address now looks like this. And so this is called a set now. Now a set or uh, the blocks that have the same index uh, has, can store two blocks in this case. That's why it's two-way set associated. Okay? And now, now your address looks like this. You still have the byte and block, but remember we organized this as uh, two sets of four columns, so your index has become only two bits because there are only four possible indices. Where, uh, you still have the same cache size in terms of the data store because each of those indices actually stores two blocks. But now your tag has become bigger, right? Because you need to be able to distinguish between uh, these two blocks that are stored uh, in the same index. Make sense? And your tag is three bits right now. Now you have more flexibility. Now addresses zero and eight well, I guess these stu still do map it to the same place, right? Is that true? Maybe you haven't fixed the 0 and 8 problem. No, addresses 0 and 8 can, uh, are mapped to the same index, actually. But now you can store both of them, right? So we've, we've, we may have fixed the problem. Because you can actually store both of them. Now, if you have the access pattern 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, they will both map to set 0, because the index bits are 0, 0 over here. And when you, when you store uh, add a, a block zero, if you will, that gets stored into one of the ways. This is called way zero and way one uh, within the same set. So set is the horizontal part. Basically, a set is, uh, uh, is blocks that have the same index in the cache. Uh, and way is basically this part. This is way zero, this is way one, way two, way three. The number of columns, if you will, that you have uh, in terms of the blocks. Uh, or the number of blocks that you can actually store in a set. Uh, so uh, the, when you access block eight, uh, it, uh, you will not miss in the cache. Well, you will miss in the cache, but you have another another place to place that block. So now zero can be stored here, and eight can be stored here, and you could keep accessing zero and eight and get an almost hundred percent cache hit Okay. So what is the downside of this? Well, upside of this is it accommodates conflicts better. Now you can get fewer conflict misses. The downside is obviously over here, right? You somehow need to have a mechanism to determine which block hits in the cache, which means that you need to have more comparators, which means that your access latency is becoming larger, right? You do a three-bit tag comparison over here and check the valid bits. To determine hits, it takes a longer time. 
because you have, and also the hardware cost is higher because you have more competitors. Okay? And also a larger tax store, right? Because you reduce the number of indices in the cache, you re reduce the number of sets in the cache, uh, the, uh, the tag bits have increased, and your tax store size has become larger. Okay. So you could take this to the next step. You can get higher associativity. Now, it, you could actually play the devil's ad advocate for this, right? What if you have four blocks uh, that you keep accessing repeatedly? 0, 8, uh, 12, 16. Well, that, that's not what I wanted, actually. 16, 32, right? Is that what I wanted? 0, 8, 16, 24. Sorry, yes, we need to go 8 by 8. <laughs> what if you're accessing 0, 8, 16, 24? 0, 8, 16, 24, 0, 8, 16, 24, 0, 8, 16, 24, dot, 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 dot. Well, this still has that problem, right? You can store only two, whereas you would like to store four in a given index. You still have the conflict misses. Well, you have a fix to that problem. Make the higher, make the cache more associative. Have four-way associativity. Now we have only two indices, but each of the sets, if you will, stores, can store four blocks. Now we are a lot more flexible. But the downside again, uh, well, likelihood of conflict, uh, upside likelihood of conflict is even lower now because we can fix that access pattern. We can store that 0, 8, 16, and 24 at the same time in the same set. But now you have more tag comparators and a larger mux, if you will, uh, and larger tags even larger tags. I don't show the tags over here, but your tag bits become, uh, in this case, two bits, right? Because your index bits is actually only one bit, zero or one. Is that true? I guess that's true, yes. Okay. Well, no, your, your tag bit becomes become four bits. That's right, I did the other way around. Your index bits is only one bit over here, zero or one, and then you, your tag bit increases by one. Okay. So note that the data mux is also getting larger, right? Because you're accessing the data store in parallel uh, with the tag store. Okay. So if you take this to the extreme, what you get is a fully associative cache. This is actually content addressable memory. Okay. Uh, you, uh, it, a block can be placed in any cache location. Okay. Uh, well, content addressable in terms of the address, right? Basically, you do a cam on the tag store, content addressable memory of the tag store. Basically, you don't have an index bit. Because every block can be placed anywhere in the cache. In this case, uh, you have eight blocks, and uh, any block in memory can be placed in any of these blocks. And your tag is the largest. Basically, if you look at this, you don't have any index bits, and you have five bits of index in this case. Okay? But this is the most flexible caching scheme. It's also the most expensive, right? Because you, every location, every block in the cache requires a tag comparator. And you can imagine the complexity of this logic. And this mux becomes wider and wider as well. OK? So you have a trade-off now. As you increase the associativity, you hopefully get better hit rates because you reduce the conflict misses. But it's likely that you increase the latency of access of your cache. Now you're OK as long as the latency of access is within the same number of cycles. But usually, that's not the case. Usually, you size your cache such that your timing is such that uh, uh, you're at the very boundary of the clock edge, meaning it's, a, it's your critical path. OK. OK, we've talked about this, right? Associativity is how many blocks can map to the same index. So let's recap a little bit. Higher associativity usually means higher hit rate. That's not always the case, unfortunately. This depends on your replacement policy also. The downside is usually is slower cache access time, hit latency, and data access latency, and more expensive hardware also. You have more comparators and larger tax store. And it turns out, empirically, people have found you get diminishing returns from higher associativity because you reduce one conflict miss by going uh, from uh, direct map to two-way associative. Going to a four-way associative and eight-way associative buys you only diminishing returns. So the curve looks like this. This is associativity and this is hit rate. Going from one to two buys you a lot in many cases, but two to four buys you less, four to eight buys you less, eight to 16 buys you less and less. Okay. So well, these are basically what we talked about. One issue that arises in set associative caches that doesn't arise in direct map cache, in direct map cache, you don't have the decision of which block in the set to replace on a cache miss because you can only house one block 
in the set. In associative caches, set associative caches, you have that decision. And this leads to uh, a lot of different replacement policies. Well, first of all, if there's an invalid block first, it's probably a good idea to replace that one, right? Well, not replace that one, but place the block that's coming in into that invalid location. But if all of the blocks in the set are valid, a replacement policy is consulted. And there could be many different choices. One could be, for example, you have a four-way associative cache, and you randomly pick one, a valid one. Is this a good idea? No? Maybe, sometimes. OK, you're getting used to the idea now. <laughs> it's actually not that bad. <laughs> and we'll talk about the reason why it's not that bad, because if you do some other policy, you get, the, uh, you get an, effect that, an effect that's called trashing. With random replacement, at least you randomly keep something that may be useful in the cache. You could have FIFO. This is probably not a good idea, first in, first out. <laughs> Depends on your access pattern. You could have an access pattern that's amenable to this. But most access patterns are not like this. Least recently used is people have found out that this is a good access pattern because what happens is you, have, uh, you, re you keep re-referencing arrays. So you have an array and you keep referencing it. You populate the cache with it and you re-reference the arrays again and again. So re least recently used works well. But this has implementation issues as, we, we discuss, as I will discuss next. It's actually becomes more complex as the associativity increases. So many processors, many modern processors implement an approximation of those least recently used. Actually, newer processors have even more sophisticated mechanisms. But not most recently used is one of them. Not most re basically, don't evict the not, uh, most recently used but, and randomly pick among the other ones. This is an approximation for least recently used. Uh, least frequently used is another policy. Again, how to implement this is interesting because how do you decide what is least frequently used? What kind of time interval do you look at? Right? And what happens if you have used something very, very frequently, and after a point, you, don't, you stop using it. Your counters have incremented in terms of frequency of use. How do you actually decrement those counters? Uh, other interesting policies, which we will talk about, least costly to refetch. So these all think about reuse, or somehow consider reuse in some <laughs> random way. But there's also, it's not, uh, caching is not only, I've, I've deleted this, but caching is not only about the hit rate or miss rate, but it also is about hit, rate, hit latency and miss latency. So if you increase your cache hit rate only to significantly increase your fetch latency, then you may not actually get good performance. Because some, some blocks may be much more costly to fetch from memory. Why could, it, why could this be the case? Any thoughts? Why could one block take longer to fetch from memory than another block? Yes? Well, it might be in a part of this, like in virtual memory, mm -hmm. for example. A actually, that's true. It may be, yeah, the block may be at a different level, right? That's actually one good reason. There, may, there are actually many other reasons. This was one of the exam questions in a past exam. If it's in, even if it's in memory, for example, it could be a robot for hit or a robot for miss. Right? That gives you a latency difference. Also, the overlap of latency matters. Maybe one block is fetched with many other blocks, so the cost of that fetch is amortized across many blocks. Whereas another block is fetched by itself, which means that if you do not store it in the cache, you'll definitely stall the pipeline because it's too long to access, uh, fetch that block, because its latency is not amortized with other latencies. Okay, so that affects the cost also. We'll talk about that when we talk about MLP over cache replacement. Basically, the overlap of latency uh, of the blocks, memory level parallelism affects the cost of blocks. Okay, people have developed hybrid replacement policies also. Maybe you have a hybrid of random and LRU, right? So think about the hybrid branch predictors. They use local branch predictor, global branch predictor. Well, you could do the same thing for replacement policies because some replacement policies are better for some access patterns and other replacement policies are better for other access patterns. For example, LRU is really good for an access pattern uh, that fits in the cache and that you keep re-referencing. For example, if you do ABCD, 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 where ABCD are blocks and you have four-way associative cache. This is great for LRU, right? They go into the same set and least recently it just works there. What if you do A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E? That's terrible for LRU, right? Because you have five things that need to go into that four-way 
set. But that's not bad for random, actually. If you do random replacement on that kind of access pattern, you'll have a reasonable hit rate. And I'll let you calculate that hit rate. That could be a good exam question, too, actually. When I say exam question, I see heads coming up. <laughs> that could be a good homework question, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. So the, you, I've given you two access patterns. Actually, this should, it should come uh, soon, I think. We'll talk about that, too. So people have tried to come up with optimal replacement policy. And uh, one policy uh, uh, that's optimal is called Bellati's optimal. Bellati from IBM designed it. Uh, well, we cannot design optimal policy, but investigate it. Basically, if you consider only the hit rate of a cache, ideally, you would like to replace the block that's going to be reused furthest into the future. Right? That maximizes your cache hit rate. That's the idea of an optimal replacement policy. The question is, how do you actually figure that out? Well, this, no, this requires knowing of the future, right? And we cannot do that today, at least. But we can predict. OK, let's take a look at implementing LRU a little bit. The idea of LRU is to evict the least recently accessed block. The problem is. This requires uh, the processor, the cache, to keep track of the access order of the blocks, right? You need to keep an ordering or timestamps. Right? And timestamps are actually not very real if you have very large, uh, large associated caches. Uh, so, okay, one question. If you have two, if you have one way set of associated cache, direct map, is, uh, direct map cache, is this a problem? No, there's no replacement policy for a uh, direct map cache, right? Because a block can go into one location only. If you have a two-way set of associative cache, what do you need to implement LRU? How do you decide that order? Yes? A bit. A bit, right? And that bit specifies which way has the least recently used. And by definition, the other one is the most recently used because we have only two ways. What about the four-way associative cache? In this case, only two different orderings are possible. That's why you need a bit. In this case, two bits. Two bits per cache block, right? <coughs> two bits per uh, way, if you will. Basically, eight bits total. Right? Yes. That's not the optimal, though. That's not the best you can do. That may be the simplest you can do, I agree. What about best? How many different orderings are possible for the four blocks in the cache? 16. Is that 16? No, I, I get something different. I know. <laughs> 24, yes. Basically, you have four locations, and you can, uh, the f uh, for, for the most recently used position, you may have four, four possible choices. For the next position, you may have three possible choices. For the next position, you may have two possible choices, because you, once you've already placed everything. So it's four factorial, 24. Which means that you can encode that in five bits, right? Instead of having two bits per way, which may be simpler, you have an encoding that specifies this is the ordering in five bits. That's less expensive, but now decoding becomes harder, figuring out that ordering. Now you need to consult the tape. Well, I guess we've already discussed this. How many bits need to encode the LRU order of a block? Well, basically, it's five bits for the entire set. Uh, what is the logic needed to determine the LRU victim? Now this becomes complicated. You need to decode that value to figure out what it maps to, and then, uh, and then actually, uh, replace the LRU victim. And then you need to re-encode it. Right. That's kind of not fun. <laughs> and as n, uh, the associativity goes higher, the complexity actually becomes higher too. Right. Basically, for an 8-way associative cache, you have 8 factorial. For a 32-way associative cache, you have 32 factorial, which is a pretty large number, I think. OK. So many processors actually do not implement true LRU in highly associative caches because of this reason. True LRU is very complex. True LRU means perfect way of keeping that ordering. True LRU is complex. There are two reasons, actually. One is true LRU is complex. And the second is, why bother anyway if this is not the best policy for all access patterns, right? It's really an approximation to predict locality. Right? It's not necessarily the best possible replacement policy. So what, uh, we'll talk about this. We'll come back to that in the next lecture. I believe. But some examples, not MRU, is a very simple approximation to LRU, right? Not most recently used. Don't evict the most recently used, but you can evict anything else in a random way. Hierarchical LRU, which I'll briefly talk about. I'm not going to detail. You can study this. But you can divide uh, 
it doesn't have, need to be four-way. Four-way, you cannot see the example really well. But divide an n-weight set into groups. It doesn't need to be two-way also. M-weight groups, if you will. Uh, and you track the MRU group and the MRU way in each group. And just ensure that those are not replaced. So it's similar to not MRU, but it's really more hierarchical. Right? And you can decide, uh, you can think about how to implement. I have some, I have a slide going over that, but I'll not go over that today. The other thing that I'll briefly go over is another cute idea, victim, next victim. Basically, you only keep track of the victim and the next victim. And everything else, you do random placement. So let's take, let's take a look into that one. Not the hierarchy. Well, you can take a look at this uh, on your own. I'll leave these slides. And I'll leave this question also. Basically, with a hierarchical LRU, you have an eight-way cache and two four-way groups, if you will. Uh, remember that you keep track of the MRU block, uh, MRU group, and the MRU way in each group. And ensure that these are prioritized. These never get replaced. And the other ones, you pick randomly to replace. Basically, on replacement, select the victim as a not MRU block in one of the not MRU groups. Make sense? It's easier to design, obviously. But uh, it's good to think about what is an access pattern that performs worse than true LRU with this kind of replacement policy? Or, and what is an access pattern that performs better than true LRU? And you can come up with both. OK, let's look at victim, next victim, and that'll be the end of this lecture. Uh, this is a simple policy that keeps track of only two block status in each set. Victim and the next victim. All other blocks are denoted as ordinary. So on a catch miss, you replace the victim block. And promote next victim to victim. That's going to be the next one to be replaced. And randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim. Poor guy, right? On a catch hit to victim, you promote next victim to victim, right? Because victim actually, maybe you were, going, you were about to make the wrong decision, right? But you didn't make it because it got a hit. And you randomly pick an ordinary block as not next victim and turn the victim into an ordinary block. Okay, so you just save this block. Of course, this is assuming an access pattern again, right? LRU in the back of our heads. Because maybe you're, hitting, you're, you're providing the last cache to the victim and you're never going to reference it again, right? Well, too bad. Okay. When a cache hit the not next victim, you randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim and turn the next victim into an ordinary block because uh, you don't want it to be evicted next, next. And vic victim remains the same in this case. And on a cache to an ordinary block, you do nothing. Because you probably selected the next victim and victim reasonably. Okay? And this shows you an example over here. Uh, and you can have the same questions as before. If you start with this, for example, uh, this is a, a set that contains A, D, C, D and A is the victim, and C is the next victim, let's get you get a hit to an A. This is the worst case. This poor guy was almost, almost going to get evicted. In this case, you ensure that A becomes ordinary. It's not the victim. It's not the next victim. This may not be the best way of encoding it. This is for illustration purposes. And uh, C becomes the victim because it was the next victim. And you randomly pick between B and D uh, uh, to uh, be the next victim. In this case, D is picked randomly to be the next victim. And you can have the same questions as before. Like, when does this perform better than LRU? When does it perform worse than LRU? But it's an approximation that's much easier to implement. OK. What time is it? I think I've already covered this. But let's start the next uh, lecture with this one. So I'll leave you, uh, leave you early today so that you can pick up the exams from Machado if you haven't done so. Any questions so far? Nothing? You can design the best replacement policy? <laughs> it's actually an area of research still. It's amazing. People have been trying to optimize the cache design for decades and decades. And there's still a lot of performance to be gained because memory latency is so high. Anything you can do to keep the data on chip buys you a lot of performance. But doing so at uh, power efficiently and in a simple way is the, is the art. OK. I'll see you uh, Friday.
you for not doing all this place. Okay, sure. Um, do you want to dump the office hours? Uh, is that is that now? Yeah, we can, we can do it now. We can start now if you want. Okay, or should I do that? Oh, I, over there, in my office. Okay, okay. yes. Sure.